Exodus chapter 30, starting from verse 17. Here is something from the Old Testament. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall make a laver of brass. That's a basin, a big basin made of brass, and the foot also of brass. To, what are you, what's the purpose of making this basin? To wash, all right? To wash inside, to wash with all. That means you're going to do some washing here. And you shall put it between the tabernacle, this is the tent, of the congregation and the altar, and you shall put water therein. Okay? So you are going to have a basin full of water, made of brass, and Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they do not die, or when they come near to the altar to minister to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord. So here is something which God commanded the Israelites to do. You will make a basin, all right? It's called here a laver, but it's a basin, a big basin. We do not have too many particulars about this particular laver. But there is a bigger version when the temple, the solid temple was built by Solomon. All right? So this laver is a big basin. Think about a big round basin full of water. And when the priests, before they go into the tabernacle, before, so they are outside on the courts. All right? That's where the sacrifices are made. And it gets very dirty. It gets very bloody. It gets very dirty. So before the priest, Aaron and his sons, who are the priests, before they enter into the tabernacle, God said to them, they must wash. All right? And look at um, verse 19 again. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands, wash their hands, wash their feet. All right? Wash. Wash. So they go through this washing many, many times. They wash and then they come out again of the tabernacle. They may do some other things, take some other sacrifices and then they get all dirty again and they wash again. So the Bible in Hebrews chapter 9, it calls them lots of wash, washing. It's like a ritual which you go through. You wash and you wash because you get dirty on your feet on your hands, what you do, so you wash, all right? And so this is the direct part of the tabernacle, part of the ritualistic processes which they do within the tabernacle, all right? Now, we all know that everything that God commanded them to do in the tabernacle was a shadow of something that is to come, all right? A shadow meaning... This is not the real thing, but this is a figure, a shadow. It's something which resembles the real thing, but it's not the real thing. But it's a shadow. But when you see what it is later on, then you will appreciate what God was asking them to do. Okay? So, for example, you know, we all wash, right? How many of you came to church this morning without washing your face, without washing your hands, you know, washing your feet? Some of you took, uh, you know, an hour-long shower before you came to church because you want to smell good, all right? Some of you, maybe, you, you know, you, you wash later on in the uh, evening, but we all wash. Nothing wrong with the washing. But here in the temple, it has specific meaning, all right? So it says here, they had to wash, otherwise they actually will die for the priests, okay? So all of this washing, we know doesn't help them because they have to do this again and again and again. But they had to be washed, okay? So just focus on this word, the washing. So they had to wash themselves, all right? Now, if you think about this for a second, this is a very strange request by God for them to do. Remember, at the outer court, there is another place where they do blood sacrifices. So that's the blood. 
This is a basin full of, come on, water, not blood. We all know this very well. It's the blood that saves us. But this is water. Water does not save you. It's like some people say, well, what does baptism mean? Baptism by water, all right? We're talking about here. So if you do not know Jesus and you get baptized, does it mean that you are saved? Come on. Let's say you do not know Jesus at all. And you say, well, I'll get baptized. Does it mean that you are saved? The answer is, of course, no. Because baptism, all right, from what we teach here, of course, means it's a symbol of, come on, date with Christ, burial with Christ, and then the last part is what? Come on, resurrection with Christ, right? So if you do not believe in what Jesus Christ did, then baptism means you just get wet, all right? You get wet because you went in the water and when you come out, well, you're wet for a while and then you dry up and nothing has happened because you do not believe in what Jesus did for you. So this is water. It's a basin full of water, not blood. The blood was on the other place where people took the animals and they sacrificed. All right? So the blood is for forgiveness. So what about this water? What does it mean for us today? All right? So let's take a look at how, at what else is this uh, labor? What other instructions were given to Moses? Exodus 38, verse 8. Okay, here's a little bit more. Not many details uh, divulge in this labor, all right? Chapter 38, verse 8. And he made the labor of brass, all right, this basin, and the foot of it of brass, of the looking glasses of the women assembling, which assemble at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So we get a little bit more detail as to how this basin actually looked like. It was made not just any brass, but the brass from the women who served at the door of the tabernacle and this brass was so shiny it was polished so well that it looks like a mirror looking glass all right remember in those days you do not have a mirror like what we have now all right in your home there's a mirror right and you look at the mirror before, you know, when you wash yourself, when you shave, when you do your hair, you look in the mirror. Am I correct? Okay, so you look in the mirror. But that's not the mirrors that they had. So they see their reflection in this highly polished, shiny brass. Pieces of brass. So they, they took this brass from the women. Women, look at themselves, all right? even in those days. So they used that highly polished brass to make this laver. All right, so look, read it again. And he made the laver of brass, this basin of brass, and the foot of it of brass, how, of what material? Not just any brass, but of the looking glasses, the mirrors of the women assembling who assemble at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, all right? So very, very polished labor, basin, all right? So if you stand before the basin, like the priest, what do you think they will see? They, they will see their own reflection, right? Okay? So, and because God said for them to wash, they will wash their hands, there may be some water at the bottom as well, depending on how high the labor is, the basin, they will wash their feet, all right? And it's made of brass. So brass, we know, is judgment, all right? So if you are judged by God, you are judged not worthy, you are judged not holy, you are judged no good, and therefore, you will die. So in order not to die, you wash, 
Alright? So you wash, but this washing doesn't make you clean forever. It makes you clean for a while. You go inside, you do what you have to do, then you come out, you get all dirty again, and then you, come on, wash again. Alright? So that's what the water is for. So this water is continuously replenished as the priests use it. Others who serve there will replenish the water and they will do this washing again and again, multiple times, maybe even in a day. All right? So that's part of the Old Testament. What does it mean for us? All right? So turn with me to John 13. John 13, verse 8. Okay, and we can read this together. Very familiar scripture again. Peter said to Jesus, You shall never wash my feet. This was when Jesus was washing his disciples' feet. And look at what Peter says, all right? Now, most people do not walk you through the verses here, all right? And I'm just going to point for a few verses here, which will show you exactly what Jesus meant when he was washing them with water. All right? So Peter said to Jesus, You shall never wash my feet. Don't wash my feet. Jesus, you are our master. You are my master. Don't wash my feet. And Jesus answered him. Okay, and here is the key to interpreting this feet washing thing which Jesus just did, just did for all his disciples. Look at what Jesus says. If I do not wash thee, you shall have no part with me. If I do not wash you, then you cannot be with me. What do you think Jesus is referring to? Do you think he's just referring to, hey, you know, I washed your feet, now you are mine. No, Jesus is referring to being washed, really washed with Him, Jesus Himself, all right? That means Jesus does the washing which makes you clean permanently. Permanently. The only one who can wash you clean permanently is Jesus. So Jesus was showing His disciples that He's going to wash them, but He shows them by washing their feet. And Peter, of course, got it completely wrong again. And Peter says, well, Jesus, you shouldn't wash my feet because you are my master. You will never wash my feet. That's what Peter said. And he got rebuked by Jesus because, not because Jesus was angry with him, but Jesus was saying, you need me to wash you clean because only by me washing you clean, you can be clean permanently. Remember, they were all Jews and they were following the exact thing which they have learned since Exodus, which is, let's wash our hands and let's wash our feet, okay? So Simon Peter said to him in verse 9, which is not up here, said to Jesus, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands, my hands, and my head. That means wash me completely, Jesus. Wash me completely. Only Jesus can wash you completely and permanently. He's the only one who can make you clean from head to, come on, toe. That's what Peter says. My head, my hands, and my feet as well. Everything. Because he finally understood what Jesus was doing. Jesus was showing them that you need to be washed. Okay? And this, once again, this is washed with water. What does it still mean? Now, let's take a look at this. Your feet get dirty, especially in those times, because you walk with them, right? And they, wear, they wore sandals, they wore uh, things on their feet, which maybe not like us nowadays, where, you know, we are pretty well, uh, you know, covered with um, latest technology, footwear, and so on. So our feet may not get so dirty as they did in their times. So their feet, walking about, the dust would stick on them, you know, the 
things from the road would stick on your feet. So it gets dirty all the time. And Jesus says, look, I'm going to wash you. It's a sign, it's a sign that I want you to do this. I want you, not, not the foot washing itself, but it points to something, all right? It points to something. So what does it point to? What does it point to? Because Jesus explained, you need me to wash you completely. But look, I'm washing you right now with water. Turn with me to John chapter 15. Here comes the explanation. John 15 chapter 3. Jesus is explaining some more. Now we are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. This is not the blood. This is the washing. Now you are clean. Your feet is now clean. Your hands are clean. Your head is clean. Through the word. You see, when you live in this world, we know that because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, by His blood, all our sins are forgiven. Past, present, and future. Why do we say future? Because nobody is going to come back and die for you. Jesus is not coming back tomorrow to die for you if you sin tomorrow. Okay? So Jesus died once and for all time. It's a one-time sacrifice, as we know very well. Never again. Jesus is not coming back to die for you again and again. All right? One time for all time. So your sins are completely forgiven. But in our everyday life, okay, in this pandemic times, many times you hear bad news, you hear discouraging news. Remember what we were talking about last week? You hear news which are fearful. You hear things which discourage you. You hear a lot of junk out there. Some of you are involved in politics. You hear worse news in the political arena. Some of you, you work in certain fields you hear a lot of bad news. You hear a lot of negative news. You hear a lot of things which bring fear to you, which cause you discouragement. Remember the spies that we talked about last time? What, did, what report did the spies brought back? Evil report, discouragement, fear. There are giants there. They are bigger than us. We are grasshoppers. Remember that? So we can never go in to possess what God gave to us because of all of this negative news. So every day our minds and even our spirit many times get fearful and get discouraged. Not because we are not safe, but because of us living here. In your circumstance, everybody's circumstance is different, all right? All from the left to the right, from the front to the back, every one of us go through different circumstances. And you get negative news, you get terrible news, you get all types of news, all right? And sometimes it happens to you. You have to go to hospital, some things happen to you, something happens to your loved ones, and these are things which are not good news. To you. But you get to see them, you get to hear them, you get to experience them. And many times, it's not even now. This has happened throughout our lives. When you grow up, your parents said negative things about you. When you went to school, your friends said negative things about you. So many times in your life, loved ones, close family members, people that you work with, play with, play sports with, they say negative things about you. I always remember in sports, all right, uh, for many people who play sports, you know, like uh, there would be that um, 
you know, group of friends would get together at, in school and they say, hey, you know, we're going to play ball or we're going to play something. And you know, you're going to have like that choosing your team, right? So there'll be like a group of 20 people and they'll choose, okay, I want this person to be on my team. Do you all remember such a thing? What do you call that? Uh, is that that's a name for that, right? Side. Yeah, choosing sides, but that's a specific name for it. How do you, how do you call that now? Um, but you choose your team, right? So I say, okay, I want you to be on my team. I want you to be on my team. I want you to be on my team. And then the other guy will say, okay, I want that person to be on their team, on his team or her team. Okay? And then at the end, the numbers go down, right? From 20, it goes to 15, to 10, to 5, to 3. How do you think the last two boys or girls feel? Nobody wants me. Nobody wants me. There must be something wrong with me. Out of two, one gets chosen. Now the one which nobody wants will join one of the team, right? Because that's how it works. But do you know what effect that has on that little boy or that little girl? In that area, all right? Maybe excellent in another area. But in the area of, let us say, it's baseball or football or badminton or whatever team it is, you know, that person feels like completely worthless, useless. Nobody wants me. I will never be good at this spot. Because nobody wants me. I'm the last one. Nobody wants me. So think about this as the years go on. And this is what you hear. Do you think this dirt of negativity is sticking on that person? Oh yeah. And it's a very thick, viscous, negativity and it sticks to that person in his or her brain and like I said, even into their spirit sometimes. It becomes a stronghold. That's what the Bible says. It is so dirty. It's untrue but that's what the world says, right? That's what your friends say, that's what your parents say, that's what your loved ones say, that's what the government tells you. And you feel so unworthy. All that thing sticking on you. So let us say you do the Old Testament way. You go into your bathroom, you wash your face, you wash your hair, you wash your body, you soak yourself in the bathtub for one hour. Does that make you feel clean now? Yeah, you're sort of clean on the skin, but it really doesn't clean you on the inside, right? You still feel lousy. You still feel like you are unworthy. You still feel bad. You look at yourself in the mirror and you say, man, you know, nobody wants me. That was the result of playing with other kids when you were five years old because you were the one left out. And sometimes... It doesn't, you know, it doesn't even have to be because you were bad. Sometimes people go, you know, many times, maybe because of your heritage, skin color. Yes, it does happen. Maybe because you were shorter or too tall. So many things. But the end result is the same. You say, nobody wants me. Oh, that C-R-A-P on your feet, that muck in your brain, in your heart, which nothing can seem to wash away. At least of all, not water. And we're not talking about salvation. We're talking about that daily, daily, hourly, mi minutely. Is there such a word? <laughs> There's no such word. By the minute. Negativity. People putting you down. People saying you are no good. 
circumstances which you have gone through since you were a little boy, little girl. Condemnation upon condemnation upon condemnation. Look at what Jesus says. Verse 3. Now you are clean, you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. That is why we place so much emphasis on the word of God. Because the only thing which can clean you permanently, permanently of all of this negativity, all of these things which makes you feel less than human sometimes, puts you so low down, gets you depressed. Many, many people are depressed. People say, help me with my depression. <laughs> Go take a bath. Well, that doesn't help very much. Go eat ice cream. Doesn't help very much. Pies. Yes, go eat pie. Yeah, it will help for five minutes. Yes, with the ice cream. There we go. Will help, yeah. While you're eating it, you feel pretty good because the brain is saying, yeah, all that sugar, release all that, uh, you know, uh, hormones and you feel pretty good. But what happens after that? Now you feel double guilty because you say, oh, I shouldn't have eaten that. Nothing helps. Look, let's be serious. Nothing helps. You can clean with anything. You can clean with Mr. Clean. You can clean with chlorine. You can clean with all the cleaners that we have in our house. Nothing helps. People are still depressed because of living in this world. This is a fallen world, as I told you many times. The only thing which will clean you on a consistent basis is if you go through the Word of God. Let me show you one last scripture. Ephesians 5 verse 26. Ephesians 5 verse 26. Okay. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water. Remember, this is water. By the Word. So you need the Word of God to cleanse you from all this muck that you got from living in this world on a daily basis. That's why Jesus says, I'm going to clean your feet. It's not the blood. It's not my blood that was on the cross. This is the water. And He says, oh, look, I'm going to clean you. Because you get stained, you get soil. People say bad things about you, especially on social media. You put up one thing and 100 things come back. Uh, no, we don't agree with you. No, they, they are not so polite. They blast you. All right? And then they, like in this cancel culture, they try to cancel you. All right? Cancel you. Cancel your business. Cancel you as a person. Cancel you as a woman cancel you as a man. So you say, well, I feel so bad. I've been criticized since I was born. The only thing that can clean you permanently on a daily basis, daily, so that you know who you are is by reading the Word of God. So let's take in one example. All right, let's put this in action. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Let's actually put this into action. Romans chapter 8, starting from verse 1. All right, so let us say you are depressed, people have put you down before, you have been condemned in the church, you have been condemned by friends, family. You are a believer. You know you are saved. But you feel pretty bad. You come to church and you leave and you feel bad. You feel bad when you come in, you feel bad when you leave. I just told you the solution. So let's put the solution into practice. 
Okay, just, just let's read the word. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now, come on, no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. What did we just read? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are in Christ Jesus. The Bible, the Word, is cleansing you. All right? And what does it cleanse? What does it say? There is no condemnation for you because you are in Christ Jesus. So why are you accepting condemnation from others? You heard this for years, you see. Uh, you will never be good enough. You are unworthy. You are useless. You are too tall. You are not beautiful enough. You are ugly. Condemnation upon condemnation heaped upon you. Let's cleanse this away from us permanently. How do you do that? Read the word. There is therefore now no condemnation for you because you are in Christ Jesus. Who do not walk after the flesh, you are not after the flesh. What those people are saying against you is all in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, after the Spirit. Of course, Paul is talking about the law here. The law is a series of things which you have to do. So if you do not do it, you are under condemnation. The law, which people put upon you. You may say, well, I, I, I do not know what this Israeli law is, this uh, Israelite, this uh, Mosaic covenant. Doesn't matter. Because men make up more laws and they put you under the law. So you are now effectively under the Mosaic covenant of laws. Look at what it says. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ, this new law, has made me free from the law of sin and death. Verse 2. Sin and death. That's what the law brings to you. You want to live by the law, it will show you your sin and at the end, it will show you death. Because you cannot do the law. You can do some of it, but you will never be able to do all of it. Everybody's expectations put on you, you cannot do it. You see, your parents say, well, you better do well at school, all right? I want you to get straight A's. Your friend says, what for? At school, come, let's go play football. The more football you play, the less time you study, right? But you have to meet everybody's expectations. And then your friends come, okay, you have to look this way. Well, if I look this way, I cannot play this game. Well, it doesn't matter. You see, everybody has a different expectation of you. More laws put on you, the more you will find yourself a failure. But, verse 3, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, once again, through the flesh, God sent sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemn sin in the flesh. Everything that the law shows you is going to be sinful. The law is going to show you how bad you are. You cannot do this. You cannot do that. What is your good? So the more you put yourself under law, the less worthy you will feel. Because it is so bad at the end that you say, I am good for nothing. I cannot do anything. And look at the last verse here. For the righteousness of the law might be... Read this carefully. Okay. Now once again, like I said, this is specifically referring to the Mosaic law versus grace. All right. But let's read this carefully. That the righteousness of the law, the law is supposed to make you righteous. But you cannot do it, so you cannot be righteous. Righteousness means right standing before God. All right? That means when you stand before God, you are made right. You are, God looks at you 
and you say, I'm righteous before God. That the righteousness of the law, if you can do everything which the law says, then you can be righteous. But since you cannot do it, you feel like that soil thing on your feet. But look at what it says here. Might be fulfilled, come on, in us, not by us. Look at this one little word. That the righteousness of the law, righteousness means right standing before God, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled. Come on. Who does this fulfillment? Us or somebody else? Jesus. Might be fulfilled in us, not fulfilled by us. If it's fulfilled by us, that means we have the capacity to completely fulfill the law. Look at Scripture, because when you read Scripture, every word has meaning. If you read it really fast, you say, oh yeah, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled by us, in us. Oh yeah, it's the same. No, it's not the same. Fulfill in us. Somebody else fulfilled it and then gave it to us. So now the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Jesus did it for me. Jesus did it for you. The righteousness of the law, all that thing which, all those years, everything which people put you down, people say things about you, and in this case, talking about the law, it was condemnation upon condemnation making you feel guilty, leading you to death. Everything. Think about when you were a kid, when you went to school, when you were a teenager. Oh, people were very cruel to you. When you went to church, people were worse to you. You thought you go to church and you will find friends. And then you find out how they ignore you. That's even worse than outside. They put you down in church. And then you got married, you had kids. All those times, that's the constant dirt upon your feet, constant dirt, condemnation upon condemnation. And then Jesus says, look, let me clean your feet with water. Blood, I did that for you on the cross. But you need to cleanse your mind from all that negativity, all that muck with the Word of God. Here comes, once again, let's read verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for you who are in Jesus Christ. Not no condemnation because now you suddenly became such a good boy or such a good girl. You're the perfect husband. You're the perfect wife. No, you are no longer under condemnation because you are in Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus. You are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, you cannot be condemned. Nobody should condemn you because you are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation, no condemnation, no condemnation, no condemnation, no condemnation, no condemnation for each and every one of you because you are in Christ Jesus. The moment you move back to the flesh and the law, you will be condemned. So you need to clear your mind of all this inferiority, I'm not good enough, I cannot do this, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, I, you know, something wrong with me. You need to clear all of this up. We're not talking about your salvation. But all of these things inside here, the only thing which can clear it up completely is 
the Word of God. The washing, constant washing with the Word of God. That's why Peter says, Jesus, I know now why you wash my feet. You want to wash my feet. Well, then wash my hands and wash my head also because I need it. Man, I'm, I always speak wrong things. That's what Peter says. Wash me. Come, wash me. It's not blood. Remember, people get confused. People say, oh yeah, he's talking about blood. No, it's not about the blood. It's about water. Constant washing with the Word of God. And when you read it, you say, man, even though I mess up so many times, but God says, there is no condemnation for me because I'm in Jesus Christ. No condemnation. So as you cleanse your mind and you say, I am not condemned. I am not condemned. I am not condemned. I am not condemned because I am in Jesus Christ. I am not condemned. I am not, there's nothing wrong with me because I am in Jesus Christ. And you cleanse yourself, cleanse yourself. Repeat this, repeat this, repeat this until the word takes hold in your heart and you walk the way God says who you are. How long does it take? For some of you, short time. For some of you, maybe it needs the next two years. And you do it. Because when you finally walk with no condemnation, <laughs> whew, do you know who you have become? Man, you become who God says you are. And uh, nothing can stop you then. Because you finally walk the way God says you are. Remember the polished mirrors? Do you all remember the polished mirrors on the basin? So imagine you standing in front of that basin. No? Polished like a mirror. The way I see it, when you look there, you shouldn't see yourself. You should see Jesus, because it's all water, Jesus talking to you. Jesus says, there is no condemnation for you Okay, now imagine you are in front of this big basin, brass, judgment, but no judgment upon you. Look at this basin, everybody. Imagine this big basin right in front of you right now and you look at Jesus. And Jesus, because He's the one who's washing you, saying to you, no condemnation for you because you are in me. No condemnation for you. No condemnation for you. And you look and you say, wow. Man, I'm clean. I am clean. I am clean. This is not some brass which is all, you know, like green in color. You can see nothing. This is highly polished, like a mirror. And when you look in the mirror, you see Jesus. You see Jesus talking to you. Jesus says, you are just like me. No condemnation for you. 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 Because you are in me. How do you think you feel now? You have just been washed with water by Jesus. I don't know about you, but I feel pretty good. Right? Right? If you look at the law, the Ten Commandments and all the other law, the law says you are guilty, you are guilty, you are condemned, you are guilty, you didn't do this, you didn't do this, you are not good enough. You look at Jesus and Jesus says you are not condemned, you are not guilty. Man, I, I think I'll stay in front of this polished brass, right? Because every time I stay there, that's Jesus talking to me. And Jesus says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you anyway. So every time you feel depressed, you feel bad, wash yourself with the Word. 
Not the blood, the, the word. And if you just continue reading on just this Romans 8, <laughs> you feel like a giant. You feel good about yourself because it's God explaining to you who you are in Christ. And that is why we are so strong on the word here. So strong. Because we need this. Constant washing, constant washing. Come, let's pray. Thank you, Lord Father, for your word.